Today, we're going to talk about the written word. Now, we all encounter so many different words in the written word on paper, you know, in newspapers, magazines, books, in our little smartphones, everywhere we look. Of course, around the world, you have so many languages, thousands of languages, uh, many different writing systems. I don't know how many of these can you read. You know, this is like a test, you know, for linguists. How many can you read? And I know I don't get very far at all before I can't read them. There's so many different ways of writing. But we look back at history and we ask, you know, when did all of this writing begin? When did people first start to write? And we don't know for sure, because even though, you know, archaeology and history work together to try to find these things, if, for example, there was some civilization that developed some kind of paper and they wrote on it and then the civilization died out thousands of years ago, we would never know because paper quickly degrades and disappears. It's only the monuments that are written on stone or clay tablets or things that endure that we find. But as far as we can tell, as far as archaeologists have been able to find, the first instance of a writing in history occur in the region called Sumer. It's the kingdom of Sumer in ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, it's right on the border of the area between Iraq and Iran on the modern map, you know, along the Euphrates River and things there. And about 3500 BC, so that's a long time ago, you know, 5,500 years or so ago, they started developing a writing system. And we know that because we found these uh, wonderful little tablets. They're made of limestone, they're carved out, and they have symbols on them. Uh, they represent heads and feet and hands, and there's numbers and threshing boards, interesting. They have symbols for cows, you know, and things like this, cattle. Uh, clearly, looking at the circumstances they're found in and what contents of the tablets, they're record keeping for the city managers and for trade. So when the, the boss of the city, uh, I don't know what they called him, they probably didn't call him a mayor, but the boss of the city, he calls his person in charge of the warehouses and he says, do we have enough grain for the winter? And the guy has to look up on the tablets how much there has and then what's the population, you know, how many new kids have been born this year and try to figure out, do we have enough grain? And, oh, we have more than enough. Okay, how much of it can we sell to our neighboring city that doesn't have enough and get something we need in return? So they started keeping these records over 5,000 years ago. This tablet was found in a city called Kish. And there's a little arrow there that shows you where it is on the map up here, Kish. Interestingly enough, in this area of uh, Sumer here, we have at the south end Ur, which is the home of Abraham in the Bible. So... They've started to excavate Nur also, and they found many things, including tablets and stuff. Maybe none of them dated quite this old. But this would all have been started with the writing, you know, more than 1,500 years or so before the time of Abraham. And this writing that we have here is not well developed. You know, you couldn't write a novel or a, a news story. It's only record keeping. But they continued to develop it, and long before Abraham's time, they had highly developed writing that you could record all kinds of things. We know that because uh, they found this, the Code of ur Namu in the Sumerian language dated approximately uh, 100 years or so before Abraham's time, 2100 BC. And this would have been the law code probably that Abraham, or Abram at the time before he was renamed, uh, was under when he lived in Ur, it would be the Code of ur Namu. It's a very interesting document. Many of the uh, laws and things on the document are very similar to what you would find in Exodus or Deuteronomy in our Bibles. There are differences, of course, very large differences, but many of the thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not take thy neighbor's wife stuff, it's all in there as well. So that was kind of the culture of those times as well as what we end up with in the Bible. And this tablet here, uh, it was broken, you can see it <laughs> fixed. If you go, I think it's in the museum in Istanbul, the archaeology museum there. You can see it, and you can see find a translation of it and read about what the law was in the time of Abram, who became Abraham. Now, later on, they continued to develop it, and this is what's called Sumerian cuneiform. 
This one is not as old, but it's interesting because it's got a long passage where uh, the king Xerxes is explaining how the great god Ahura Mazda selected him and put him in charge. So he's the king and you're defying the gods if you, if you oppose him. Uh, a little bit self-serving, I think, for the king to put that out. Uh, carved here very nicely. You know, he's saying his authority comes from this dude. It's it, it kind of interesting. It almost sounds like a Japanese name, Ahura Mazda. You know, it's kind of an interesting name this guy had. But this is uh, what was became the highly developed cuneiform that they could write anything in. This only dates to about 500 BC. So you kind of have the, the bracket there, you know, in uh, big increments of time from this code back to that original tablet I showed you and then Abraham's time in the middle. So this is kind of writing would have been in use still at the time, for example, of the Babylonian exile in your Bibles. They were probably using this sort of Sumerian cuneiform in Babylon and things. Now, of course, everybody knows about Egypt and the Egyptian hieroglyphics. And you got to admit, this is some of the prettiest writing you'll find. Okay. Some of those Egyptian hieroglyphics that they find in the tombs are still all painted in the original colors and things. I don't know how long it would take to write a long novel or something in this kind of script. You know, it would take you a little while to paint all these different colors on your emblems. This is from the tomb of Seti I, 13th century BC in Egypt. This is interesting because this would date uh, more or less to the era of the Exodus. You know, not exactly, but close to the time of the Exodus from Egypt. And it would have been the type of writing you would have seen all around you probably if you had lived in Egypt in that time. Egyptian hieroglyphics. Now this may look like very simple kind of symbolic symbols to just be like a bunch of nouns, but they use them uh, also uh, to portray uh, verbs and everything. So you could write complete nice, uh, what do you say, essays, documents with this as well. Uh, now, what about the East? You know, this is all in the Middle East here and over to Egypt and stuff. What about Asia? Well, India developed a script quite early, not quite as early as they developed it in Sumer and things, but we don't have a lot of samples of it. Nobody can read it. <laughs> all the samples that we have are just little short things like signs or, or stamps, you know, like Incon type things. No big documents from India, and they haven't been able to decipher the writing. We do have Chinese oracle bones from about 1200 BC, pretty close to that same time. Uh, these are the beginnings of kanji, you know, and maybe you can look at that and you can kind of think, yeah, I can see where that's kind of, you know, working its way toward being the kanji script that we have today. Uh, so these oracle bones in China, you know, they recorded things like uh, fortunes and blessings and things on them. Uh, spiritual things were recorded on these and they had other record keeping for, you know, supplies and things, I assume. Uh, these are interesting because of the connection to kanji, but you see it's actually in China the development that we know of is quite late compared to the Middle East. Uh, writing had been established probably in the Middle East for 2,000 years before they started using it in China, even though we think of the kanji as very ancient. So here's a little chart. It gives you kind of an idea of the development of writing as best as they can tell. Uh, in ancient times, you know, first Sumeria and the Mesopotamic region and then Egypt and Elam, which we didn't talk about. And then you can see India is over there, but nobody knows how to read those little samples of Indian script from that time period. And it goes on developing through different areas. And then China is down here at 1200 BC or so. This is writing in ancient times. Now, one of the interesting things about the Chinese writing is it appears to have developed completely independently from writing in other parts of the world. Uh, the writing that they look at in the Middle Eastern area, you start with those Sumerian symbols and it appears that people learned about those and they said, we need to write our language too and they develop things that have some kind of relationship. Uh, a little bit of debate about whether the Egyptian hieroglyphs are really related to it but most of the archaeologists think they're at least inspired by that same idea, that tablet with the little drawing pictures and things. It's the same basic idea as hieroglyphs. But what you have in China is an independent development of a completely different type of writing system than the other places, very different. Even India may have been influenced by the Middle East. 
Uh, where else was there an independent development of writing system? Anybody want to take a guess? Besides the Middle East and Mesopotamia and China, all of these Americans, and nobody says America. Yeah. yeah. The Mayans, the Mayaglyphs, uh, are also appear to be a completely independent development of writing. Uh, it's only dating to about 200 BC, what they can find so far, so it's not nearly as old. But this looks completely different than any other type of writing known around the world. Very, very different thing. And you see here, around the world you have these different people and they have their needs and they're trying to figure out how to invent writing systems. And they do it in different ways. You know, we have the scripts that rep start out as little pictures. We have the scripts that start out as markings for sounds. And then later you have alphabets. Uh, there's a lot of different concepts that go into these writing systems. In Japan, of course, we have the kanji and then hiragana and katakana. And really in Japan today, you have to read English characters too, because if you go shopping, you see the signs everywhere. You have to be able to read at least a little bit of English to understand the signs. I know sometimes older people complain that they can't read the English signs that they find in the department stores and things. Uh, it becomes a real challenge, you know. I know when I came to Japan, because I love to read, one of the big challenges for me when I first got here was suddenly discovering, wow, I'm illiterate. I cannot read anything or write anything. And that really bothered me. So I had to work very soon to start to learn to read uh, and to try to focus on that. And you never finish learning to read in Japan uh, because there's always more kanji that you don't know. But, you know, writing is very important to us. And it can be very disorienting to be a person who's used to reading books and stuff and suddenly you can't read anything when you move to a new country. Uh, interesting thing. Now, of course, this is the beginning of the long golden week and we're going to have a change of uh, reigns, a change of emperor. So we have to mention when we talk about writing here in Japan, the Manyoshu. This is one of the earliest uh, documents written in Japanese, old Japanese. Uh, it's written about 759 AD, and uh, Nihon Shoki and the Kojiki would be a little bit older, maybe 40 years or so older. And you see here the new imperial name comes from Reiwa, from the man Yoshu, and they just kind of grabbed uh, the, the Rei up here and the Wa down here, out of this poem, Man Yoshu is a collection of poems, and it's talking about, you know, the, the beautiful plum blossom season and stuff. So they say it translates to beautiful harmony. Uh, unfortunately, if you just look at the kanji, I think you get a little bit different impression than beautiful harmony. It looks a little bit like commanding harmony or ordering peace or something, you know. It doesn't look like you're given much choice. But they say the meaning as you take it out of this context is beautiful harmony. So we're about to enter this new imperial reign and we have to learn how to write the date all over again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> writing Heisei won't be enough anymore. Okay? So that's a brief history about where writing came from a little bit around the world and stuff. But where are we today? Well, where we are today is we have millions and millions of books in thousands of languages and of course every other kind of written document that you can imagine is out there and all of these books uh, are available to us these days with the computer age you know you can get on your computer and you can buy copies in digital form or find them or if you have to you can go to the bookstore or the library and find them but most things you can get right in your cell phone these days it's really quite amazing uh, Sometimes it's hard to find, you know, shopping for a book if you're looking for a particular thing, uh, depending on whether it's in the services you usually use or whether you have to shop in a new service. But there's so much out there. Now, when you think about influence on history, you know, certain books have had a huge impact on history. And one book has had more influence, more impact on history than any other book. By far more influence and more impact around the world. Uh, and that, of course, is the Bible. The Bible has had more influence, more impact in almost every corner of the globe, and for a very long time now, 
And there's hardly anywhere that the culture is not touched or influenced by the Bible. Even in places with very few Christians, they still have cultural elements that actually came from the Bible and that influence, or elements of their government or their laws that actually come from biblical ideas. And it's very hard to, to find a country these days that doesn't have an influence from the Bible. Its influence is so huge. Worldwide is by far the most popular book. Uh, they estimate close to six billion copies have been produced and uh, purchased or distributed sometimes for free. You know, that's a lot of copies. You know, that's almost the population of the planet, you know, of copies of Bibles out there. It's by far the most translated book. Uh, they estimate 670 complete Old and New Testament translations, complete Bibles, and 1,500 New Testament translations are out there, different languages. You know, it's a, it's a library. It's not just a single book like a, a novel or something, but it's a whole collection of writings that are brought together that were written uh, roughly from about 1500 B.C. to 100 A.D., plus or minus a little bit there, just the big time frame, the window there. And uh, you have these different authors that are writing, and then there's uh, people who are looking at them over the history, and they're appraising them, and they're saying, yeah, this is inspired by God, and it's recognized as inspired writing, and it's collected into this work that we now publish in one volume, or you can get in one app on your cell phone mm -hmm. for the Bible. So it's really extraordinary. It's by far the most loved book in the world. You know, millions of people, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of people read the Bible every day because they find it is such a blessing and so useful for their lives. It gives them peace, it gives them comfort, it gives them wisdom. You know, and it's been that way for a very long time, even before the Bible was complete, when there was only a few of the books had been written comparatively. Already, there were people who just loved the Bible. You know, there's a psalmist in Psalm 119 uh, in your Bibles. He, he writes this long psalm about how much he loves the scriptures, the word of God. And he has only a tiny part of it compared to what we have now, you know probably no more than a fourth of the Bible we have now was available to him, but he's already writing this thing about how much he loves it. Uh, so he says, I just picked a couple, three verses from Psalm 119, they're not in order, but just to show how much this guy loved the Bible, he says, I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. This guy liked the Bible, you know? <laughs> and there's still millions of people today who love the Bible. And as you read it, you can just feel the comfort and encouragement from God and all of this. But when we look at the whole of Scripture, we find there's even a more deeper purpose than that individual sort of comfort and blessing. And that's the testimony of the Bible to the Messiah, the Savior who was to come. You know, and Jesus, after he came, you know, he's speaking in the Gospel of Luke, and he says, concerning the scriptures, he says, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. That's the Old Testament. They had it divided into three parts, and those are the parts. The Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, that's Easter that we celebrated last week, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And now, almost 2,000 years later, that's what we're doing today, actually. You know, we're preaching about Jesus in the nations, you know, and about repentance and forgiveness of sins through faith in Christ and through his death on the cross and his resurrection. So what Jesus says here 2,000 years ago, he's looking back across all of the things that were written about him before he came, the prophetic writings that told all about him, and he's looking forward all the way to Osaka today, saying this is going to be preached in all the nations. So what is the message? Very simply, the message is, that God loves each and every one of us so much, but we're separated from him by our sins and wrongdoing. And through faith in Christ, we can reconcile with God because he died for us on the cross. And we can receive new life because he rose again in the resurrection. 
Now there's a lot more to it, but that's the core that it all begins with, is that very simple little message. So let's take a look here at uh, John chapter 1, and just for a moment we just get this idea. Jesus is more than just a man. He's God come in the flesh in the person of a man. And this is what it tells us in the Gospel of John about Jesus. He's the living message of God, the living Word of God. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Now we're going to skip forward a little bit, but we get down here and it says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So we have given to us as a gift from God the right to be adopted into God's family as children of God through faith in the name of Jesus and trusting in him and what he's done. I just want to encourage each and every one to trust in Jesus, trust in him and receive that blessing of eternal life and just take joy in the word that, you know, it says over and over in the Bible, it is written. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for writing this wonderful invention, no doubt led from the beginning by your spirit and according to your plan, which allowed the recording of the Bible and all the prophetic utterances about the Messiah, the Savior to come, and the record that we look at today to understand who Jesus is and, and what he's done for us. Thank you, Lord, and thank you that Jesus did come and die for us, that you came, Lord God, in the person of Christ and exchanged your earthly life for our salvation and payment of our sins. Thank you for the resurrection, which proves the promise of eternal life, that we can uh, receive eternal life and be with you forever and ever. Help us, Lord, to understand, to read your word, to learn to love your word, and to walk with you. Bless each and every one. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.